In this episode, Ben Leibowitz and I introduce eight technology and policy options, four are strategies for enhancing water supply, and four are for better managing water use. At stake is the integrity of the Colorado River system and its capacity to deliver water to major cities, tribes, farmers, rural communities, and many natural habitats across the basin. My name is Ben Lebowitz, and I'm a graduate student in the Nelson Institute for Environmental Studies at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. On the supply side, the first option is municipal water recycling, which means running water from users to sewers to water treatment facilities, where the water can be cleaned and then reused. This option is currently being pursued in several municipal water districts in the Southwest, including Las Vegas, Phoenix, and San Diego. The second supply enhancement option is desalination or in other words, turning salt water into potable water. Desalination requires a highly energy intensive separation process that also creates a heavily saline and potentially chemically contaminated byproduct that is released back into the ocean. In the Colorado River Basin, there was one desalination plant providing water to the region. It is situated in Carlsbad, California at an old electric plant site. It is owned by the San Diego Water Authority and provides about eight to 10% of their water. The third supply enhancement option is to import water from other regions. This option is included in the list because it is often raised. It is not further discussed, however, because it is both very expensive and highly infeasible, both socially and politically. For example, the Great Lakes region has a multinational compact that legally bans them from exporting water from the Great Lakes out of their basin. The fourth supply enhancement option is stormwater recapture. L.A. County is now spending nearly $300 million a year to capture more stormwater, including so-called spreading grounds where runoff can seep into the soil. Los Angeles and other Southern California water agencies are at the forefront of these efforts, as they are actively developing the capacity to capture and store urban stormwater. Currently, Los Angeles County captures about one-fifth of its yearly stormwater flows, and county officials estimate that it will take three to five decades to reach a 300,000 acre feet per year potential, or around 20% of current water use. In other words, all of the options for enhancing water supply in the basin are long-term prospects, and the main two are recycling and desalination. The most important is probably recycling, because it is less expensive than desalination and feasible in most cities. Excluding California, the only way that five of the other six Colorado River Basin states can participate in the desalination option is to help pay for desal plants elsewhere in exchange for someone else's Colorado River allotment. Indeed, Arizona's governor has actually made such an offer to California, and the Arizona state government is also investigating the prospect of recovering desalinated water from an inactive plant in Sonora, Mexico. Recycling, meanwhile, has the potential to save about 15 to 20 percent of current Colorado River water use in perpetuity. This is a powerful idea and prospect, and it is a proven technology in Las Vegas, Phoenix, and other locations in the basin. The challenge is that most municipal water systems do not have the infrastructure in place to recycle municipal water back to consumers. This option will be expensive, arguably on the order of $2,000 per acre foot of water, and will take many years to achieve, even if local water authorities were to face no political, financial, or regulatory barriers to getting it done. Desalination plants take even longer to build, because they have even more hoops to jump through in terms of environmental impact and sitting along the coast. Recently, a plant in Huntington Beach, California, that has been under discussion for over a decade was voted down unanimously by the California Coastal Commission. Put simply, both recycling and desalination are long-term, expensive options that have very little to offer in the short or even medium term to solving the current crisis. Both are small pieces of the Southwest's water supply currently. However, they hold the potential to play a bigger role in the future, but if and only if significant investments are made sooner rather than later. Let's return now to water use management options, the only options with short-term potential to address the Colorado River crisis. Here they are again, agricultural water use reduction, municipal water use reduction, strengthening tribal water rights, and managing growth. The first, agricultural water use reduction, is without a doubt the most immediate and significant option. As discussed in many of the previous videos, over 70% of Colorado River water use is in agriculture, mostly in forage and feed crops for livestock, but also for winter vegetable production. 
While these crops are crucial to the incomes of farmers and rural communities in the region, and are substantial food sources for livestock and consumers, they can be scaled down in a manner that does not necessarily put farmers out of business or dramatically affect food supplies. The main strategy on the table for reducing agricultural water use in the Colorado River Basin is rotational fallowing. This refers to taking agricultural land out of production for a short period of time, then bringing it back. There are two goals with this. First, to reduce water use by lowering the overall amount going to agriculture in a given period of time. The second is to avoid permanently losing agricultural land and associated activities. If agriculture is responsible for 75% of water use, and we need to reduce total water use by 15%, then 20% of the agricultural land could be fallowed. And if fallowing efforts are focused on even more water consumptive crops, then the same amount of water could be saved by fallowing even less than that. Additionally, farmers could be compensated for this reduction in water use. Additional payments could be targeted to workers and rural communities that are highly dependent on farming, and this could be accomplished without imposing major losses on rural areas. The challenge is designing this strategy in a way that gets buy-in from the concerned parties and is fair and sustainable. Reducing municipal water use is the second most important option available in the short term given that 20 to 25 percent of the Colorado River is consumed by cities and towns. The main challenge is that many urban areas have already pursued demand management efforts for some time. We've reduced water usage uh, by 38 percent, which is a, a pretty big drop. Um, I think it's the biggest in the, in the country, actually. Multiple different ways, the fixtures, low flow shower heads in, in our residence halls and low flow toilets, things that aren't shiny, flashy, exciting things. But, you know, as, as we add all of those together, they, they start to have a really big impact. Local water authorities have used the carrot of lower prices for households and businesses using lower volumes of water and the stick of higher prices for those using higher volumes. We described this inverted water pricing scheme in the video on the weird economics of water in urban areas. Local water authorities have also required and or paid for removal of lawns and other xeriscaping efforts to reduce outdoor water use. What are you doing? Well, I noticed you love watering grass where grass has no business growing, so <laughs> I figured. <laughs> oh, that's nice. Remove useless grass. This approach is in full swing in Las Vegas and several Arizona cities. These types of urban water demand management efforts have led to significant declines in per capita water use in many southwestern cities over the past 20 years. Still, more could be done in most cities, and some municipalities have done relatively little on this front. The main emphasis will have to be on reducing outdoor water use, which accounts for around 70% of municipal water use. In the end, this probably means removing lawns, covering pools, reducing water to golf courses, and encouraging landscapes with desert-hardy plants. It is conceivable that municipal areas could reduce water by 20%, with drastic measures, but this would only reduce Colorado River water use by about 5% overall. In combination with agriculture cutting 20%, this could help to reach a 25% reduction, a number suggested last June by Camille Toten, Commissioner of the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation. But unprecedented is now the reality and a normal in which reclamation must manage our systems. A warmer, drier West is what we are seeing today. Strengthening tribal water rights at first glance may not seem like it fits under demand management options. However, tribes with adjudicated water rights have been among the leaders during recent years in helping the Bureau of Reclamation to manage drought by leaving water behind dams at Lake Mead and Lake Powell. These voluntary and compensated reductions in water use are direct demand management steps. Strengthening tribal water rights could involve both moving forward on adjudicating their outstanding claims to water in the system and in allowing them to transfer their water rights to other users willing to pay for the water. Put simply, another way to improve demand management is to allow water to move to higher valued uses. Tribes are well positioned to be suppliers of water to other users as well, especially municipal water authorities willing to pay for that water. Higher prices will encourage more conservation in the overall system, improving sustainability outcomes. It will also improve equity outcomes by paying tribes more for their water that is rightfully theirs. The final demand management aspect we feature is managing growth, or restricting developers and others to build housing and other infrastructure that encourages expansion of towns and cities across the basin. 
the report, one of the things we said is this, this could be um, the San Fernando Valley of Phoenix. Grady Gambage Jr. helped write the first reports for Superstition Vistas. His projections at the time, 900,000 people by 2060. We can grow another million people or, or more, frankly, but we have to start making um, tough choices. Tough choices, Gamage wrote, because this whole strip of desert has no water rights. This option is again more of a long-term strategy aimed at helping to ease future population pressures on this increasingly arid region. To be effective, this option has to be pursued at a state or even regional level in a collaborative manner. If it is a local, voluntary, and hence piecemeal decision process, then no region will want to be the only one putting up the stop sign for development. If nobody volunteers to go first, then in all likelihood, it won't happen. So in the short term, demand management is the only solution. This primarily includes reducing agricultural water use through rotational fallowing, reducing urban water use through less outdoor water consumption, and encouraging exchanges and transfers of water across users to support the move to higher value uses of water. Supply enhancement measures such as recycling, desalination, and stormwater recapture will take much time and money before significantly contributing to crisis reduction. In the next two policy videos, we dive deeper into the logic and design challenges of rotational fallowing schemes for agriculture, as well as developing markets and exchange mechanisms for transferring water to higher valued uses.